So, uh, as Cody said, I mean, we're faced with a challenging situation where you've got a card-carrying fascist as the Vice President of the United States uh, ready to, to the extent that we allow him, use the power of the United States to impose fascism on the rest of the world. Now, the irony of this is that 60 years ago, the United States was the key nation in the world which freed the world from fascism. Had it not been for the Roosevelt's successful ending of the Depression in the United States and building the United States economy to the point that we could become the arsenal of democracy for the world and mobilize with the planes, with the tanks, with the material and so on to bring the war to a conclusion by 1945, the Hitler project of the Synarchists might have succeeded. Uh, if, if the war was not brought to a conclusion when it was, it's not out of the question that Hitler might have developed atomic weapons uh, and succeeded in destroying most of civilization for a long time to come. Or if the United States had not entered the war, uh, the war could have gone on for 10 to 15 years. There's a famous book and there's a uh, old 1920s Hollywood movie called uh, Things to Come. The book is based on H.G. Wells' book, The Shape of Things to Come. Uh, and what Wells, what Wells describes in this book uh, as a game plan, this is, this is the actual blueprint for World War II from the standpoint of the synarchists, which is that you would have an, a war which would last for 10 to 15 years on the European, in the European theater. Germany and Russia would bleed each other forever. The United States would ultimately get dragged into a war in the Pacific uh, with Japan. Uh, but we would duke it out for about 10 years in the Pacific. Uh, this would have worked, by the way, if it weren't for MacArthur, because the British were ready to turn Australia over to the Japanese, except for a little sliver down on the bottom, the, the so-called Melbourne line. And if the Japanese had had the logistical base of Australia to wage the war in the Pacific from, that war easily could have gone on for 10 years. And then the idea of Wells and the rest of these, these utopians, these fascist utopians, is after most of civilization had bled itself for 10 years, they, the airmen, the men of science, in reality the supermen, you know, would step in and, and with their bank for international settlements, which they'd established in 1931, to be the banker's dictatorship over a shattered world, uh, that would have been the shape of things to come. Uh, that's what the British, that's what the synarchist, that's what the fascist project was ultimately all about. But because of the United States, it didn't work. Because, the, because, because of the military leadership of people like MacArthur, and again, most especially because of the industrial power of the United States, we were able to end this war by 1945. So, but here we are 60 years later, and the United States has become the staging ground for this same fascist movement to use now the military power of the United States as the, the bludgeon to bludgeon the rest of the world into this, this fascist dictatorship. Uh, their bank for international settlements didn't quite work because their Hitler project failed. So the bank for international settlements, which they created in 1931, is a nasty institution, but it doesn't run the world. So as Cody said, this group that met in Siena, Italy uh, about a month ago and proposed a new global central bank with a global currency and so on, that is their plan for the world after they finish destroying civilization, after the United States triggers war with Iran, war with North Korea, ultimately war with Russia, China, and so on. When there's not much left of the planet except these, these lunatics, they step back in with their central bank and they finally achieve their dream of a global fascist empire. So, but how did we get from the point that we were the nation that saved the world from this synarchist horror 60 years ago to actually being the nation which right now is the staging ground for their policies? And if you look at, there, there are two elements to this. One is the synarchists, the fascists didn't go away. They were, their, 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 pro, their Hitler project failed, but they didn't go away. Uh, one of the reasons they didn't go away is because the minute that Franklin Roosevelt died, 
the people in U.S. military intelligence and others who were investigating the synarchists, the files that were compiled in the 30s and the 40s and so on, in terms of these, the, the fascist bankers' deployment of various <coughs> political movements, Hitler, <coughs> Mussolini, Franco, you know, I mean, they really don't care what flavor dictator they have as long as he simply destroys civilization for them. Um, the, the, the investigations of these synarchists were shut down. Uh, Lynn had a friend who was in U.S. military intelligence who died some years ago, uh, and he reported that literally within days of Roosevelt dying, all the people in military intelligence investigating synarchism were fired and the files were closed. So there was no active understanding of the actual nature of this enemy. Uh, so the enemy was left essentially able to regroup, propagate, reinfect, and so on. But that wasn't the only problem because the more fundamental question is that the American population and its leadership in the period from the end of World War II to where we are today have continued to make a series of really bad decisions because the American population and its leaders increasingly shrank from their responsibility of knowing how the world worked uh, and became little people. Lynn once wrote a, a piece entitled How the World War II Generation Was Shrunk because that's exactly what happened, starting with his generation when they came back from World War II um, and shrank into suburbia, shrank into my life has been on hold for 10 years or 15 years. I lived through the Depression. We had to go to war. We had to sacrifice. We didn't have sugar. We didn't have coffee. You know, we didn't have, um, you know, nylon stockings because they were making par parachutes out of them and so on and so forth. Uh -huh. You know, I, we haven't been able to start our family because our husbands were off fighting this war and so on and so forth. So now it's time for us to get ours. And don't bother me about what's going on in the rest of the world. And that overtook most of the World War II generation. Not all of them, but most of the World War II generation. This was intensified by the McCarthy period. Now, the, Joe McCarthy and the big anti-communist witch hunts of the late 40s and the early 1950s I haven't done any investigation of this, but I will absolutely guarantee that this was a synarchist operation. I mean, maybe somebody in our staff has done an investigation, but you don't need to do an investigation to be able to smell what you're actually looking at. Because what did the McCarthy period do? It basically said the only criterion for patriotism is if you're against the communists. So where did that leave all the fascists? All right? you know, free to do whatever they damn well pleased. And they were more anti-communist than anybody, right? So the, the fascists who were still within the institutions in the United States and so on were given a free pass during this period of time while we were running around, you know, uh, carrying out witch hunts against Hollywood directors and, you know, somebody who thinks that, you know, you should have social security and, you know, so on and so forth. And the American population tolerated this. I mean, I, I remember in the 1950s, I was very young, I was born in 49, but I remember there would be these weird discussions in my household where someone would come over and visit my parents and they would be talking very quietly over in the corner. And I, you know, there was something scary about it because there was something they didn't want anyone to know they were talking about. Not that they were even leftists or anything, but just talking about something which might get you branded as a communist you know, caused them to shrink into themselves and stop thinking about the role that they had played and the role that we still had a responsibility to continue to play. Uh, so you, you had this shrinking into littleness, which began to lay the basis for the series of bad decisions that have been made over the decades. Eisenhower had a certain understanding of what this synarchist network was, but he just didn't describe it very well. I mean, it was Eisenhower and the U.S. Army that came in and put an end to the McCarthy witch hunt. It was the army, so-called Army McCarthy hearings in Congress where, where the McCarthyites were actually starting to go after the Army, claiming there were communists in the Army in order to dismantle our traditional military so, again, the fascists could take over. And that put an end to, to, to uh, the McCarthy period, but the damage was largely done. Eisenhower did have an understanding of the utopian faction, but he wasn't very precise. He called it the military-industrial complex. 
you know, which makes you think that anybody who's building something, you know, is a bad guy, which is not what Eisenhower meant, but he wasn't terribly precise in terms of his identification of this. And as soon as Eisenhower left office, this fascist movement, this synarchist movement, you know, essentially went berserk. Uh, and the Cuban Missile Crisis was one of the key elements of their attempted uh, reassertion of policy power uh, in the United States. Uh, and then, of course, you have the assassination of President Kennedy about a year later, in 1963. Now, here's where I think you can begin to see the kind of really bad decisions that the, the World War II generation made. I mean, the baby boomer generation, my age, and I was 14 years old when Kennedy was killed, wasn't a lot I was probably going to be able to do about it. But what did our parents do about the Kennedy assassination? Nothing. Nobody believed it was Lee Harvey Oswald. Absolutely nobody believed it was a lone assassin. And they just sat back. And if anybody, even, you know, uh, Jim Garrison, the New Orleans prosecutor, or um, what was his name, Mark Lane, who made a name for himself trying to prove that it couldn't have been a lone assassin, the media laughed at them. And even though the majority of the American population probably agreed with them, the media was laughing at them, which means my neighbors are laughing at them, which means I'm not going to do anything about it. So the President of the United States was assassinated, and the World War II generation did absolutely nothing about it. And the effect of the Cuban Missile Crisis the assassination, the war in Vietnam, and so on, is what Lynn has described in many cases, in many, many different ways clinically, as the genesis of the baby boomer problem in the United States, which is the world is so terrified. I've got no control over everything. They can kill presidents. We could get blown off the face of the earth tomorrow. You know, if killing Kennedy wasn't enough, then five years later, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy were killed, just in case you maintained a little bit of hope you know, that something good could happen in this country, especially the civil rights movement, which King created on the basis of the best principles of the American Revolution, on the principle of the general welfare and agape. The assassination of King, the assassination, assassination of Bobby Kennedy was sort of like the final stake through the heart of the chance that most baby boomers had of actually dealing with the world. And then, of course, you know, as we know, the entire counterculture was created as a way of sucking people into the do-your-own-thing mentality, which is what has now dominated decision-making in the United States, and that's why we ended up with a choice in the year 2000 between Al Gore and George W. Bush. Uh, you know, this was not... Sure, the establishment, you know, wanted to narrow the field down. The synarchists wanted to narrow the field down. But nobody held a gun to the head of the American population in the primaries in 2000. They did not have to go into the voting booth and vote for George W. Bush and Al Gore in the primaries. In 25 states, they could have voted for Lyndon LaRouche. In a lot of other states, they could have voted for Bradley. Obviously inadequate to the historical crisis, but not a lunatic like Gore or a complete mental moron like Bush. So this question of, you know, what has happened to the American population uh, over the course of the past 50, 60 years, I sometimes think would be a wonderful subject for classical tragedy. You know, have Shakespeare come back or have someone here become a Shakespeare, uh, you know, and take some of the figures from this period in terms of actually looking at the tragedy that ensued during that period of time. Uh, now, that's exactly what Plato did. That's exactly what Plato's dialogues uh, are. There are many things. They are the most profound spiritual exercises, as Lynn has discussed them. They are, are the most powerful, uh, rigorous discussion of how the human mind knows the universe uh, as Plato says in the Republic, where you, uh, you know ideas only through ideas, and you, you know higher ideas only through ideas, not through your senses. Uh, it's that. But Plato's dialogues are also something else. Uh, they're, they're the history of a tragedy, which developed, uh, I actually, ironically, 
in about the same time frame as the degeneration of the United States since the end of World War II, uh, a period of time of about 50 or 60 years in which a nation or a group of city-states, it's not really appropriate to call it a nation, uh, did the same thing that we did at the end of World War II. They freed the world from the worst oligarchical empire that had ever existed, at least in that part of the world, which was the Persian Empire. Uh, some of you, I'm sure most of you from, who've been at previous classes remember the maps that I've shown where the Persian Empire rules everything from India all the way through the Middle East into Turkey. They've conquered the great civilization of Egypt and so on. And then they come up against these tiny little city-states in uh, Greece. You know, it's sort of like the entire establishment coming up against Linda LaRouche. Uh, so they come up against these tiny little city-states in Greece in 490 uh, at the Battle of Marathon with a military capability which is three times bigger than what the Greeks have on the field. And the Greeks completely shatter them, uh, kill 6,000 Persians, and only about 150 Greeks are killed uh, in two days of battle. Now, when the Persians come back 10 years later to try again with a naval assault and another assault, the Greeks do it again and stop the Persians from any further advance, actually begin to roll back the Persian control in some of the Greek city-states in Turkey, in Asia Minor, and so on. So you have, a, a, you have these, these Greek city-states who have succeeded in stopping and beginning to roll back this tyranny uh, in 490, 480 BC. And yet, uh, by 430, they're embroiled in their own civil war. And by 404, Athens is forced to an unconditional surrender. Um, and in 399, they execute their greatest son at the time, which is Socrates. So in this period of time, from 490, and 480, for, for, through the 490s through 470s, when they're defeating the Persians, to the death of Socrates in 399, which comes five years after Athens has had to completely surrender. And I'll go through what's going on in Athens during this time. And I'm going to put some timelines on the board and so on. Did they surrender? They surrendered to the Spartans, but basically the Persians were back behind the scenes manipulating everybody but they surrendered in their civil war which was Athens versus Sparta essentially at that point although these Spartans were actually a little more uh, lenient than some of the other allies the Thebans and the Corinthians wanted to literally kill every man in Athens uh, in retribution which the Athenians had done to the population of Milos earlier which I'll mention the Spartans actually stopped it in part because I think I think they stopped it for pragmatic reasons because if Athens was completely obliterated, the Thebans would probably become very strong. But, I mean, you literally had the possibility that every, every living male in Athens, which would have included Plato, uh, would, could have been executed uh, at the surrender in 404 BC. So what Plato's dialogues actually do is, in, on, in this domain, because as I say, they do many, many, many things. They're unbelievable works of art that are functioning on many, many layers, is they're actually, Plato is writing after the death of Socrates. He starts writing in the 480, 380s and continues to write till his death, which I guess is in the 340s or 50s, maybe Nick or somebody remembers exactly. But um, uh, what he's doing is he's writing the tragedy of Athens, what had led to this disaster at Athens, just as we have to look at the kind of decisions that have led to the near tragedy that we're facing here in the United States right now. So what I want to do is, first of all, just give you a little more of a sense of the history of this century in Greece, uh, and then locate Plato's dialogues, because Many of the dialogues you can actually identify when Plato set them, not when he wrote them, that's different. But he would set a particular dialogue and you could tell that it was set in 416 BC or it was set in 450 BC and so on. And when you take Plato's dialogues and you take the time when he sets them as a kind of Shakespearean tragedy, you know when Julius Caesar takes place, you know what's happening. 
you know when um, you know the uh, the histories, Richard the Third, the Henrys, and so on. You know when those took place in British in in English history, and when you actually are looking at the plays from the standpoint of the mistakes that were made by the policymakers or the population. That's in in reality the only way you can understand and actually perform the plays. Plato's dialogues have very much that same kind of quality. So. What I'm going to do first is just give you a general history with, you know, of, of the period to get a sense of the depth of the tragedy that actually unfolded uh, in Athens. How many times they made terrible decisions. Good people made terrible decisions or not bad people made terrible decisions. And then some bad people made terrible decisions or people who had been good people became bad people and made terrible decisions because they couldn't get out of the box. They couldn't get out of the traps that they were in. So first I'll try and give a general picture just so you get some kind of sense of what happens in this period. Then I'm going to go back and identify how the dialogues then fit into that and how some of the figures in the dialogues actually fit into that. So, um, uh, but to step back, so to start again with the Persian War, the war with Persia, which for reference, you can think of this as their World War II. Uh, the wars with Persia last. Took me years to get these dates straight, so maybe I can save you some time. The Battle of Marathon is 490 BC. Uh, then there's a naval battle in 480 BC, which is Salamis, and this isn't going to last very long either. Um, and then there's other battles which continue until about into the 470s BC. And this this is the Persian. These are the Persians. This is the Persian War. Now. I mentioned the last time in some of the previous classes that one of the things that characterized Athens as opposed to a whole lot of other Greek city-states on the Ionian coast, which is Turkey, many of them surrendered, many of the city-states without fighting, many of the city-states in, in like what is today Macedonia surrendered without fighting. They surrendered without fighting because they went to what I call the Fox TV of the day. Uh, they went to the Oracle of Delphi and asked the Oracle uh, what they should do in the face of the Persians. And the Oracle, which was a Persian agent, said, surprise, you ought to surrender. So many of these places surrendered without fighting. A little bit earlier in the earlier period, about 540 BC, uh, one of the leaders of a city in the Turkish area, Croesus, um, The uh, reason I'm writing it is you can see a wonderful painting of a student of Rembrandt at the Getty, which is Solon of Athens visiting Croesus. It's, it's beautiful. Um, but Croesus was the leader of Lydia. And he asked the Oracle of Delphi um, if he should attack Persia. And the Oracle of Delphi says, if you attack Persia, a great nation will be destroyed. So he says, cool. I've got, the, I've got the answer I'm looking for. Uh, so he attacks Persia. But of course, as somebody pointed out later to him, he forgot to ask which nation was going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So the Persians defeated Croesus uh, and conquered Lydia, and he became a satrap, a, a, a lackey, essentially, for them. But this is how a lot of decision-making and, and policy-making was made during this period of time, but not with the Athenians. The Athenians did not consult the Oracle of Delphi they made a decision on the basis of what was best for their city, what was best for their neighbors, what was best for their nation, and they decided to fight. And by doing so, they succeeded in finally turning back the Persians. So uh, this, is, this, this is the Persian War period. Now, at a certain point, uh, the Greek city-states, and this includes both Sparta and Athens, I mean, they are allied with each other during this period of time. They create what is called 
the Delian League. And it's just an alliance of the Greek city-states to work with each other and fight against the Persians. Now, what the Athenians proposed is that everybody who was in the Delian League had to contribute ships, mostly ships, uh, to this. A lot of the smaller states that really didn't have the men and materiel to produce the, their quota of ships just gave money. So there was a treasury set up to collect all of this money. Uh, uh, it was called the treasury at Delos, which the Athenians regulated for the defense. The idea was to spend this money for the defense of these Greek city-states from the Persians, and that was set up in 477. Um, but things began to change inside Athens, uh, and a kind of, um, oh, maybe a Richard Nixon phenomenon took place in Athens. They, they began to get corrupt, imperial, and so on. And at a certain point, a decision was made, probably, I would guess, under the influence of the Oracle of Delphi, uh, that really they didn't have to worry about the Persians any longer. And they didn't have to fight the Persians any longer. It was under control. They, the argument went. So in 450, the... Uh, a decision was made to stop fighting the Persians. And instead, the Athenians took the money from the treasury and used it to build up Athens. Now, there were some beautiful things built, like the Parthenon, you know, and the other beautiful things that we've seen. The people who did the building were classical artists and so on. But it was actually money that had been originally allocated to defend civilization from this Persian enemy, which really hadn't gone away. In fact, what the Persians were figuring out how to do by this time was to defeat the Greeks from the inside as opposed to attacking them frontally. So yeah, it didn't look like the Persians were that much of a military threat, but they were still there intending to actually destroy uh, what Athenian civilization actually represented. Uh, and um, and really this decision in 450 to stop fighting the Persians, to ex essentially ignore the fact that this threat to civilization still exists, is really the beginning of the end uh, for Athens. Now, the leader of Athens at this time, time, time is Pericles, uh, the so-called great Pericles. Uh, and Pericles was very much under the influence of philosoph so-called philosophers, uh, who I'll come back to, uh, which was the Sophists. These are the, um, these are the soft core Straussians of the day, as opposed to the hard core Straussians, but I'll come back to what I mean by that. Um, and, uh, and it's really from this point on that the decisions go terribly, terribly awry, very much like the United States after World War II. There was an enemy operation being run. The, pit, the Persians were running ideological warfare inside Greece. But the real question is, why did the Greek population succumb to it? Why did they fall for these different operations? And uh, the way this thing operated was, you know, absolutely tragic. Because by, um, as, as soon as they stop fighting the Persians, what do they do? They start fighting among themselves. Uh, you've got various colonies that decide they don't want to be paying tribute to Athens, and so they go to the Spartans, and you get these, these little skirmishes going on uh, for quite a while until it actually breaks out into open warfare. And this is now the Peloponnesian War. Peloponnesian War. I think it's got two P's, who knows. And this is the war that now breaks out between Sparta and Athens. The Oracle of Delphi has got its hands in this without question because a lot of these, the, the spats that sort of build up to it, this colony doesn't want to do this, somebody attacks that colony and so on, a lot of this is precipitated by the leaders of these little cities going to the Oracle of Delphi and saying, what should I do? And the Oracle of Delphi tells them, and it usually and it ends up in this degenerating series of spats uh, between these countries, between these these cities. So uh, the war begins 
the opening clashes begin in 432. The war begins in 431 BC. Now, uh, Pericles knew this was coming um, at a certain point. It was obvious by the mid 430s. So his strategy was uh, what was called the Long Walls or the Great Walls. And that is, Athens is near a seaport, the port of Piraeus. So, and Athens had lots of overseas colonies, which is where they got most of their food anyway, and their material, because you don't grow a lot in Greece, you can ask Ted. Um, they had to import a lot of stuff. <laughs> they had to import a lot of stuff. <laughs> so they, they were used to getting most of their food stuff and food supplies from, from uh, uh, importing through the port of Piraeus and so on. So per Pericles' idea was, all right, well, we can, you know, we can maintain even more. We're going to bring all the population inside of Athens. We're going to build these long walls around Athens, which no one is going to be able to actually breach and pull the whole population in and we'll just have to sit out this turns out many many year long siege so the Spartans attack people flee the countryside everybody pours into Athens and of course what happens when you're doubling or tripling the population of a city like this without adequate sanitation and so on and so forth you got a plague within one year of the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War uh, you, had a, you had a plague breaking out in Athens and actually, Pericles died just two years into the war because of the plague. Um, uh, uh, the epidemic starts in 430, and Pericles dies in 429. So, but this thing goes on for another nine years. Now, you have to understand, the way this was fought most of the time is they would, like, fight for one or two months out of the year. Uh, it would result in the complete disruption of agriculture and all sorts of other stuff. It's not like they were fighting nonstop. 12 months a year, but it was enough to completely deplete and disrupt the functioning of life in Athens. So by 421, there's an effort to actually stop the war. Uh, a figure named Nicias, we'll come back to him, negotiates peace with Sparta, and it's called the Peace of Nicias. Spell it with a K or a C, it doesn't matter. Um, but this is undermined just two years later. Uh, there's a very um, ambitious, smart, attractive, uh, young Athenian named Alcibiades uh, who was brought into Pericles' household at a certain time, sort of raised with Pericles and so on. Somebody whom Socrates, as we'll see, tried very hard to educate and turn into something. Uh, and Alcibiades ends up being one of the key tragic figures throughout this entire period of time. And you'll see he shows up in a lot of the dialogues. In fact, there's one dialogue devoted to him. It's not a major dialogue, but it's a historically powerful little dialogue. Alcibiades undermines the peace. He convinces the Athenians to go back to war. Uh, so the war commences again. Hostilities recommence in 418. Uh, in 416, remember, we're BC, so we're going backwards here. Uh, this is when, actually Helga referred to this, this is Thucydides' description in his book, The Peloponnesian War, of what the Athenians did on the island of Milos. Uh, this was an island they were demanding tribute from. The Melians didn't want to participate. They didn't want to participate in the war. They didn't want to participate in the tribute and so on. And they try and argue with the Athenian representatives that what should determine Athens' relationship to Milos is justice. And the Athenians say, no, we've got the power. That's all that counts. So you're going to submit. So they defeated the Melians, and they killed all the men and boys and took all the women and children and sold them into slavery. This is Athens. This is the great Athens that we're talking about. That's 416. So you get a sense you know, what is already happening in terms of the mindset of a population which has now been at war except for this one interval uh, since 431 B.C. Uh, then, during the same period of time, you get probably the most tragic, psychotic decision of the entire Peloponnesian War, which is Alcibiades and his pals convinced the Athenians that fighting the Spartans and fighting the guys right around them in the... Uh, uh, Aegean Sea and so on and so forth. The, yeah, the Aegean Sea. This isn't enough. 
that they should go take an expedition to Sicily uh, and conquer one is, what is one of the rich, what was at the time one of the richest cities uh, in the Mediterranean at that point. So Alcibiades convinces the Athenians to do this. But just at the point the expedition is about to be launched, there's some kind of unquestionably Persian Oracle of Delphi manipulated provocation. And um, uh, there is a, uh, an act of sacrilege which takes, one, takes place one night uh, in Athens. Uh, now, all over Athens were these things called Herms, which was short for Hermes. Uh, the messenger god and so on and so forth uh, and you would put garlands on these things and they would indicate all sorts of stuff and so on it was part of the religious practices these were giant penises just so we know what the herms were <laughs> uh, we're not dealing we're dealing with a pagan society let's not forget uh, and I'm serious I don't joke about things like that <laughs> <laughs> so what happened one night is somebody desecrated all the herms. Uh, you know, I knocked them over. I don't know if they drew little faces on them or what. <laughs> but they desecrated all the herms. And this was a big, big deal. And what you basically had at that point was the McCarthyite witch hunt with everybody pointing to everybody else having done it. And Alcibiades was one of the key people who was immediately fingered. Now, Alcibiades wasn't known for being terribly religious. I mean, he used to goof off on the gods and so on and so forth, and he did like a good time. But there's no indication he did it. It looked like it was a political dirty trick used to just create more insanity and chaos inside Athens. So Alcibiades was accused of this. He was supposed to be one of the three commanders because it was his idea to go lead the attack on Sicily. Uh, leading the Athenian fleet to Sicily. It was himself, Nicias, from the Peace of Nicias, and another guy who doesn't appear to be that important, except he wasn't much of a, wasn't much of a uh, military commander. Alcibiades says, I don't want to go on this expedition unless this trial is over. I don't want to have this thing hanging over my head. But they convinced him to go anyway. And by the time they got to Sicily, they decided to convict Alcibiades, and they sent a ship to bring him back at which point he escaped along the way and went over to the Spartans. Uh, so they've lost one of their key military commanders. And so this war, this, this thing in Sicily is a nightmare. It's a horror story. Nicias is one of the commanders. He's a decent person. But obviously, as you see from one of the dialogues where he appears, he really does not have a grasp of the kind of universal physical principles or historical principles necessary to actually make decisions when leading men, leading soldiers, and so on. And uh, they suffer a series of defeats in Sicily. And Nicias says, I need a lot more men and a lot more ships. He actually thought that, that the Athenians would say, forget it, we've given you enough, come home, it's over. Instead, they're so psychotic, they send more men and they send more ships. So they're prepared for basically the final or the most important battle. And it's all set to go. And there's an eclipse of the moon. This is in August of 413. And Nicias takes this as a sign that they should call off the attack. So in the meantime, the Syracusans, the Sicilians, and they had some help from the Spartans by that time, uh, realize that this major attack is about to take place. They're able to counterattack they end up capturing all of the Athenians. 7,000 Athenians are captured. Uh, a large number of them are thrown in the bottom of a quarry and basically just allowed to die in this quarry. And so, I mean, it's a horrible, horrible slaughter. They lose hundreds of ships, thousands of men. Nicias dies and so on. Uh, and, uh, but Athens keeps going. You know, the war keeps going. Now, in the meantime, Alcibiades is in Sparta. When did that last? That was in 413. Yeah, actually, that, those are some important dates. Let me put that up. <coughs> so, um, in the meantime, Alcibiades, who's gone over to the Spartans, comes up with a new military tactic, which is instead of just showing up once a year and fighting their month-long battle, and then people could go back to their homes in the countryside for a while, although the, you know, the agriculture was disrupted. 
What Alcibiades proposes to the Spartans is they establish a permanent fort, which means people could then never leave Athens and never go back to their homes and so on, which had a really devastating effect on the economy and the people of Athens. But um, there's a... Uh, there's a brief revolution inside Athens. Remember, during this whole period of time, Athens is technically a democracy. That is, there are assemblies which vote, which judge, and so on. There's councils of elders and leaders and so on and so forth, but technically it is a democracy. A democracy, mind you, not a republic. Uh, people are getting a little unhappy with the way things are going by 411. Uh, in fact, this is the time when Aristophanes writes his, his drama, Lysistrata. This is the famous drama where the women of Athens all go on a sex strike until their husbands stop fighting the Peloponnesian War. Uh, and it's, it's directly in response to uh, uh, the disaster in Sicily. So you can see things are getting a little, people are getting a little upset by 411. And there's actually an oligarchical coup in Athens at this point. <coughs> now, what you're going to see for the remaining period of the Peloponnesian War you're going to see that you th have things going back and forth between the oligarchy and the democracy. Uh, there are no good guys in this fight. Uh, there's no white hats, there's no black hats in this fight. So, I mean, we, you know, of course, we talk about the oligarchy today. The oligarchy is sort of the larger swamp within which the synarchists are a much more evil version and so on and so forth. Oligarchs are bad. We don't like oligarchs. But, uh, but you basically had a situation where Plato had not yet written the Republic. The idea of a Republic was not really something which was articulated. So you had this swinging back and forth between what really was mob democracy and then the rule of some few group of people who tended to be the nobles and so on. So you had this brief oligarchical revolution in 411 uh, but the Democrats basically reasserted things in 409. But again, just to make clear that you don't have good guys and bad guys, after the Democrats, the democracy took over again in Athens, there was another peace offer. They could have ended the war in 409. And the democracy, which were frankly the more rabid imperialists than the oligarchy, said no, they wanted to keep the war going. So here's another opportunity to end the war, and it's thrown aside. Then in 406, there's a major naval battle. Alcibiades actually ends up back on the Athenian side. Alcibiades was a piece of work. While he was in Sparta, he laid up the Spartan king's wife. So, you know, he wasn't exactly, you know, welcome there very long. So he had to escape Sparta. And he actually ended up going over and hiring himself out to some of the Persian satraps in Lydia and Turkey and so, so on. Uh, but ultimately, he actually gets called back to Athens for a brief period of time and uh, actually begins to succeed in leading a couple of successful battles against the Spartans, against the Persians, and so on. Uh, but there's a, another naval battle in 406, which is successful. The, the Athenians win. But a terrible storm comes up, and the generals, you basically had generals commanding the immediate situation. The admirals were higher up. Um, the generals were not able to save the uh, uh, injured, injured sailors and the damaged ships and so on. So a lot of sailors and ships were lost in this storm, even though they won. Now, you know, again, here you get the, the mentality of the population of Athens at this point. They decided to try the generals, even though they were actually finally winning a few battles because they had not adhered to tradition and basically sacrificed themselves because they all would have died if they tried to uh, save these sailors and so on. Because they had not been able to save these sailors, they were put on trial. Now, this is one of the few cases where Socrates himself is involved as a judge in this. He's the only one who argues that they should not be executed. Uh, he's completely ignored. They're all executed you know, sort of like the best and the brightest, including Pericles' son, who was one of the generals who was executed uh, in 406. Now, um, a couple of the uh, generals got off. Uh, I'll just mention their names, but we'll come back to them. One name you already know, uh, Anitus, 
from the Mino dialogue. He's the guy who shows up halfway through the dialogue and basically threatens Socrates and then leaves. And then another fellow named Thrasyllabus, uh, who is both Anitas and Thrasyllabus are very much radical Democrats. They get off, you know, so you have a feeling like there's something going on here. That, the DLC. Yeah, the DLC, probably. So we're near the beginning of the end now of, the, of, of Athens because um, this killing of, of their best generals basically sealed their fate. So by 404, uh, Athens surrenders. And the Spartans and their allies meet. This is what I mentioned before. Sparta's allies were Thebes and Corinth. They met. The Thebans and the Corinthians proposed doing to the Athenians what the Athenians had done to the Melians, which is to kill all the men and boys. The Spartans said no, probably for pragmatic reasons. Uh, and instead, they established a, uh, a tyranny. This is the so-called famous 30 tyrants period, an oligarchy, administering Athens on behalf of the Spartans uh, in 404 BC, which became very, very violent. Uh, it killed political opponents. It killed people so they could take their territory or their property and so on and so forth. Uh, and then finally, in 403 BC, the tyrants are overthrown by the Democrats. And the key people, I just discovered this, I find it very suspicious, I'm going to investigate it more. The key people who lead the democratic overthrow are Anitas and Priscillabus, two guys who got off in 406 from being executed along with the rest of the guys. And Anitas, of course, is the person who then ultimately in 399 accuses Socrates and brings him to trial in 399. So again, when you look at this, there ain't no good guys in this. Uh, not everybody in this picture is a bad guy. Uh, a lot of people are simply not capable of recognizing how they're being manipulated to destroy themselves from within. You know, like here in the United States, we've had presidents in this tragic period of time, uh, like Bill Clinton or Ronald Reagan, as different as they are, are the same in a certain characteristic. They weren't Nazis, but they had their flaws, they had their stupidities, they actually had no idea, or else didn't want to face, what the enemies of the United States were actually doing. And many of the figures that played as crucial, these crucial roles uh, uh, have the same kind of flaw. So that's the general overview. Now, when you actually look at Plato's dialogues then, and the figures in Plato's dialogues, which I've been planning to do for a long time and finally did it on the plane coming out here. Right over Arizona, I said, oh my God. <laughs> These dialogues are absolutely amazing historical intervention, pictures of what is going on at precisely this time. So what I'm going to do now is, um, I'll get rid of this, and we're going to map the dialogues against what's actually happening. What was the event that in 411? 411, you had a brief oligarchical overthrow, and the, the, uh, and the, the democracy was overthrown. And then by 409, it went back again. Um, so, actually, the dialogue, which I think is dated the earliest in terms of, I'm not saying when they're written, obviously, but when they're historically dated, uh, is the Parmenides dialogue, which takes place in about 450 BC. Uh, I'm going to come back to that at the end. Uh, that, as any of you who have read it know, is a uh, very serious dialogue. I mean, Plato is taking Parmenides extremely seriously as basically his main intellectual opposition. Um, and as I say, I'll come back to the actual significance of that. But I think it's significant from the standpoint, I guess I erased it, 450 B.C., remember, 450 B.C. is when the Greeks decided to stop fighting the Persians, uh, which is really the point at which they start to become manipulated internally and end up fighting each other. So I think it's not insignificant that Plato sets the Parmenides dialogue, sort of setting the intellectual battle lines 
right when the first really lousy decision is made by the Athenians. But I'll come back to the significance of that, I think, at the end. But then the actual sort of political unfolding really begins to pick up with the, out, the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. So Plato actually sets three dialogues in 432, right before the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. So, you know, he's obviously... He, and he's writing these dialogues for an audience that just lived through much of this, you know, or their parents just lived through much of this. So obviously what is he doing what, by, by picking this date of 432? He's saying let's look into the minds of people in 432 that w- would have led to these terrible decisions being made. So one of the dialogues that's set in 432 is this little dialogue called Alcibiades, uh, which is a little, it's a little gem. I mean, it's not that much of a, um, it's not the most heavy weight of Plato's dialogues, let, let's put it that way. But it's Socrates having a discussion with the 18-year-old Alcibiades before he's achieved any political or military positions and so on. And he encounters Alcibiades, uh, who's on his way to basically try and get himself elected to one of the councils. And uh, Socrates has a beautiful dialogue with Alcibiades about, well, what is it you're going to offer the people of Athens? What do you know? Why, why, should, you count, why should they ask you to counsel them? You know, he says, what did you, um, you know, what did you study? You studied music, gymnastics, the traditional things that Athenians were, were taught, uh, mathematics and so on. He says, so are you going to counsel the... Um, are you going to counsel the Athenians on wrestling? Uh, are you going to counsel them on, you know, on um, geometry? You know, why, why would they want to elect you? He says, no, 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 I'm going to counsel them on affairs of state. And the dialogue is then a discussion about what do you know about that? What, what are the overarching principles that should go into someone making decisions for a nation? Do you know what justice is? Do you know what virtue is? And so on and so forth. And as is often the case, Alcibiades doesn't have a clue in terms of what any of this is. But there's a very uh, ominous but ending to this, which, again, when you look at, remember, Alcibiades ends up precipitating the Sicilian expedition, getting convicted, defecting, going back. I mean, he's just, you know, he's all over, the, all over this period of time. Um, the, the very last, di- the last sentence between the, two, the dialogue between the two of them, Alcibiades says, well, that is the position, and I shall begin here and now to take pains over justice, because he was basically challenged that he really didn't know what justice was. And Socrates says, I should like to think you will continue to do so, yet I am apprehensive, not from any distrust of your nature, but in view of the might of the state, lest it overcome both you and me. So, you know, think 50 years in the future in terms of how Alcibiades and Socrates both end up. Now, there's another dialogue which is also set uh, in 432 B.C. This is another uh, smaller dialogue. Uh, It's the Charmides. Some people pronounce it Charmides. It's C-H-A-R. But in Greek, that's a K. That's a hard sound. Um... And the key figures in this, again, also set in 432 B.C., are Socrates, his good friend, Chariphon, who just seems to be devoted to Socrates. He shows up in one or two other dialogues. Critias and Charmides. Now, Critias and Charmides are both related, actually, to Plato um, and are also related going back to Solon. Uh, Critias, I guess, is his uncle or his second cousin, I, I was having trouble following the genealogy. And uh, Charmides, is, um, Charmides is the nephew of Critias. So you're, you're dealing with two people whom Plato knows very, very well. Uh, Charmides is younger than Critias, probably by a generation. Now, who are these people? Well, Critias ends up, and we run into Critias, of course, again, because there's a whole dialogue. Well, there's a partial dialogue. The Critias dialogue, which is part of the Timaeus Critias trilogy, but the Critias isn't finished. Uh, but Critias ends up actually being one of the 30 tyrants who takes over 
in uh, 404 BC. Uh, uh, and you know, again, it's one of these situations where you've got somebody who probably was not evil to start out with, but swept up in the madness and the insanity that takes over Athens during this period of time. By the time the 30 tyrants take over, and you know they represent people who are furious with the Democrats for having kept the war going and going and going. It's extremely b- brutal. A lot of people are executed. Property is confiscated. Uh, and it's a really lousy period of time. And Critias is one of the key figures in terms of the 30 tyrants. Carmides supports him you know, as sort of a family thing. And both Critias and Carmides are killed in 403 when the tyrants are thrown out and the Democrats come in. So here's Plato writing a dialogue at the beginning of this process in 432, knowing at the end of the process these two key figures are going to end up getting killed. And uh, the question in this dialogue is very similar to Alcibiades, which is, do you know what temperance is? Which, do you know, you know, do you know what this particular virtue is that you might want to govern your life by? And he starts out in a dialogue with Carmides, who then gets stuck, turns it over to Critias. And what becomes very clear is that Critias has got a certain connection to, well, it's sort of like William Bennett, you know, on the Book of Virtues. You know, you have these definitions of what it means to be good. You know, you have a definition of what it means to be patriotic, a definition of what it means to be a good father. You know, you have these definitions of virtues without any, any content, any understanding of what these virtues are. And uh, it's obvious from this dialogue that this is Critias' problem. He really just doesn't know how to make any decisions on the basis of any universal principles. And this one also ends in a um, very uh, gripping way, you know, with Plato obviously knowing what the future is going to hold. Um, because... The whole thing evolved around Socrates being, Carmides had a headache, and Critias said, do you know how to cure his headache? And Socrates says, well, I know you actually have to cure the soul before you can cure the body. So the whole dialogue starts from this standpoint, but then they finally get back at the end to, can you cure the headache? And Socrates says, well, I'm not, you know, we've sort of decided that we can't answer any of these questions, so I'm not sure I can actually, you know, cure the headache because I haven't really cured the soul. And um, Critias says, um, uh, Critias basically says to Socrates, well, you must use force to cure Carmides because you haven't fixed his soul. So just do, basically do whatever you have to do to him. Uh, and um, uh, Socrates sees Carmides and Critias talking. And he says, there, there, what are you two plotting to do? And Carmides says, nothing, we have already made our plot. And uh, Socrates says, you, so you will use force before even allowing me to uh, make my case, basically. And uh, uh, Carmides, uh, Carmides says, you must expect me to use force since Critias gives me the command. Take counsel, therefore, on your side as to what you will do. And Socrates says, but that leaves no room for counsel. For if once you set about doing anything and you use force, no man alive will be able to withstand you. And Carmides says, then do not you withstand me. And Socrates says, then I will not withstand you. So again, these are the people who use force when they are the 30 tyrants, Carmides simply supporting it, but during this very violent period in Athens. So again, you know, I read this dialogue you know, once or twice and found it nice. And then I realized historically where it was pla- placed, at which point it becomes much, much more gripping. Now, the other major dialogue set in 432 is the Protagoras. Um, and this has got quite a cast of characters uh, because it's got the main sophist of the period, Protagoras, uh, who had been brought to Athens by Pericles in 444 B.C., uh, and he's been running all over Athens, sort of like William Bennett, you know, teaching the Book of Virtues, uh, teaching people how to speak, how to act like they have virtue, and so on and so forth. He had a tremendous impact on Pericles and most of the leaders of Athens. And this question of who the sophists are and the, 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 
many of Plato's dialogues actually address the sophists. The sophists, as I say, are kind of like the soft, soft core Straussians. Uh, you know, they don't necessarily come across as fascists, but their basic argument is you can't know the truth. So, or there is no truth. Or if there was truth, you couldn't know it. Or every man is his own truth, uh, and so on. In other words, a complete rejection of any universal principles. And so what the sophists would do is they would run around teaching people how to give beautiful speeches so you could just convince people of your side of the argument. Uh, you know, kind of like debating clubs in the United States today, which should be banned because they don't care about the truth. Uh, and really, the debating clubs are just sort of like, uh, you know, a more innocuous version of sophistry. But Pericles was very much under the influence of these guys. And again, the question of is there a universal principle that you should be guiding your decisions on out the window, whatever works, whatever is pragmatic, whatever is best for you, uh, whoever can give the prettiest speech, or as we see a little bit later, whoever's got the greatest force, you get to set the policy, which is what you're dealing with the Straussians today. So in the Protagoras dialogue, again, 432, just as they're embarking on this insanity, you have three sophists in this dialogue. Protagoras, Hippias, and Prodicus. Um, and then you've got two key political figures. Uh, Alcibiades is in this one, and Critias is in this one. Now, Alcibiades and Critias are working with each other throughout this period of time. Alcibiades ends up on the side of the Democrats. Critias ends up on the side of the oligarchs. It really doesn't matter because both sides are being manipulated. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, uh, it's George Bush versus Al Gore. I mean, the, the, the Straussians are playing this, this from the synarchists, are playing this from the top across the board. So those are the, the three dialogues set in 432, um, just at the, you know, the outset of this whole thing. So it's the uh, Carmides. Uh, Alcibiades and the Protagoras. So the next main dialogue which is set, it's not a big dialogue, but it's an important one, is Lachis. Uh, and who's one of the key figures in Lachis? Nicias. Uh, Nicias is one of the older figures and he's having a discussion with Socrates on how to educate young people and it's clear that he doesn't have any idea how to actually educate young people again he's, he adheres to certain virtues he's probably one of the better figures up until he blows it on the Sicilian expedition you know in this period of time probably better than Alcibiades or um, uh, uh, Critias but again, without an understanding of universal principles, he's not in a position to make any decisions. So the Lockheed's dialogue is set in 420, right in the brief period of time when you have the peace of Nicias, but Alcibiades succeeds in overthrowing it, and the war starts again. So you can read this dialogue from the standpoint of, you know, if Nicias had actually understood what Socrates and Plato, what Socrates was discussing with him, maybe he would have been able to understand what Alcibiades was doing and prevented the war. Yeah. How are you determining what time these are set in? I haven't done the original research. Some of them simply, I, most, of, most of them where you can actually put a date to it identify some historical event in the dialogue which allows you to do it like somebody just got back from a battle or something has just happened when I get to the Republic it's not completely clear when the Republic is there's disputes but I, I, I think I mean I come down on one side or another but there's there's for these dialogues there's internal evidence which makes it pretty clear uh, some of the dialogues there doesn't seem to be any internal evidence uh, sometimes he sort of des describes the relative age of people in the dialogue, and since you know when they're born, you can, you know, backdate it and so on. So, um, 
so that's the, the uh, Lockheed's dialogue. Then, let's get to 416. Because um, 416 is the attack on Milos and then the decision to go into the Sicilian expedition. And uh, I have a plot. Uh, because this is when the symposium is set. The symposium dialogue is set in 416. Uh, and of course, the symposium is one of the two dialogues that Shelley translated. So you actually have a translation of Plato, which is beautiful literate English, which you can't say for most other translations of Plato. So I think somebody ought to think about performing the symposium on the basis of Shelley's translation. So. Um, <laughs> Can you have it done by the next time I get here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now, who's in the symposium? Uh, again, you've got quite a fascinating group of people. Uh, but the main figures, once again, are, um, are you've got a sophist, a guy named Pausanias, who's a disciple of one of the other sophists. Uh, you've got Aristophanes, the playwright. And... Uh, I'm not sure what to make of Aristophanes. I, I haven't really read all that many of his plays. I just sort of know of them. He writes a play attacking Socrates called The Clouds. He also writes Lysistrata. He attacks the Sophists. He hates the Sophists. He hates the war, and so on. So I'm not really completely sure what to make of him. But he's one of the figures in the symposium. Uh, but the main figure in the symposium is guess who? Uh, the most important figure in the symposium who bursts in at the end of the symposium roaring drunk and, you know, challenging everybody. Alcibiades. Uh, and what is happening? This is just as Alcibiades is convincing the Athenians to go to war with Sicily. So, um, and this is where Alcibiades has a long discussion about how he tried to seduce Plato when they were off on a military, or Socrates when they were off on a military campaign and Socrates wouldn't be seduced because what Socrates really wanted to do was to develop Alcibiades' mind, which you see in the earlier dialogue and so on. So it's clear. I mean, this, is, this guy is a tragic figure. I mean, Socrates saw something in him, tried to actually develop something in him. And what you see with him showing up over and over again in these dialogues, you know, is Plato's record of, you know, where the tragic flaws obviously came in. So... Um, and that's 416. Then, Which dialogue is that? that is the symposium. And it's a great dialogue because it's a drinking party, so, you know. And at the end, the only two left standing are Socrates and Aristophanes. All the rest of them are. In fact, I think at the end, it's actually only Socrates. <laughs> who apparently, I mean, the historical record said he could drink anybody under the table. And, you know, maintain his, you know his cognition, you know, continue his philosophical arguments. He could just, you know, yes, I'm sure Linda LaRouche is very similar to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, then you get to this. Uh, we had, oh, I, I erased it. You had the 411. You had this brief uh, oligarchical revolution. wasn't that big a deal. And then in 409, you had the chance of another peace treaty, but they rejected a peace treaty. So the Republic, which obviously is the major work addressing all of the problems of this period. Now, this is one where there's arguments in terms of where, when it was actually written. I, I and David Shaven, so that's all you need. Uh, I think it was done in about 411. The only other possibility is somebody claims it's 420, but it just doesn't make sense from uh, some, of the in, some of the characters who were out of Athens until 414. They didn't come back to Athens until 414, 415, so I don't see how the dialogue could have been earlier than 414, so I think the 411 date. And again, what do you have in this dialogue? I mean, you've got Plato's brothers, Glaucon and Adamantus. You've got Thrasymachus, one of the leading sophists of the time, you know, who is the person who makes the argument that might makes right. 
that there is no such, that justice is whoever's got the biggest army. Um, but who are the other characters in the play? This takes place at the house of an old man named Cephalus, who seems to be a decent person, and is a rather charming exchange between him and Socrates at the beginning, where he says he really doesn't care all that much about money. He's lived a good life, and that's what's important, and so on. And one of his sons, um, Polymarchus, uh, is one of the people engaging in the dialogue with Plato. Now, Cephalus had three sons, uh, Lysias, Euthydemus, there's a dialogue about Euthydemus, and uh, Polymarchus uh, in this dialogue. Now, Polymarchus ends up getting killed by the 30 tyrants in 404 BC. So again, when you're sitting there reading the Republic, you know, remember, one of the figures ends up getting killed, you know, in this mess that takes place with the fall of Athens and so on. Um, and then also the Timaeus and the Critias take place right the day after the Republic. Remember, the Timaeus starts out, we just had our discussion about the creation of a state, uh, and now we're going to talk about the creation of the universe. And then the Critias follows that. And remember, now, I mean, it's really quite shocking when you think about it. The Critias, which is the discussion of Atlantis and Athens being a great city, and was supposed to talk about the uh, development of an actual state, is being narrated by Critias, one of the leaders of the 30 tyrants. Um, and, you know, Plato is not treating him like a Pol Pot in this, or in any of the other dialogues. He's actually, again, treating him as somebody who has tragic flaws which end up engulfing him and the entire, um, and the entire uh, uh, society. So I'll just mention two other dialogues because they really do, I think, make the point. Were, were those other two there in 411? Yeah, they, ta they take place the, right, the next day after the Republic, so they're 411 too. <coughs> and then in 405, one of my favorite dialogues because it's so rambunctious is the Gorgias. He's one of the top, top, top sophists in all of Athens. Uh, he was one of the key influences on Pericles, one of the key people who probably undermined any concept of truth-seeking. Um, his philosophy was based on the idea that nothing exists, uh, and if it did, we can't know it anyway. So it's your original whatever philosophy. Um, and... Uh, uh, and this dialogue uh, is quite rambunctious. I mean, you think Socrates is going to get in a fist fight with Gorgias and Paulus and, and so on at some point. But this is being set, you know, in 405, so it's right before the collapse of Athens. So if you go back and read the dialogue, which I'm going to do, from the standpoint of realizing what the state of mind of people in Athens must have been by this time. You know, they were basically all mad you can understand why this is such a completely rambunctious, you know, fistfight type dialogue. And then finally, um, the dialogue which is set the latest except for the death of Socrates because of course the three dialogues that deal with the death of Socrates the Credo, the Phaedo the Apology, not in that order um, those are set in 399 But what is the dialogue which comes right before this? Amino. And again, who's one of the key, who's, who's, there's two figures in um, the Mino, uh, besides Socrates and the slave boy. There's Mino, who was a rich noble, uh, who was a student of Gorgias. Uh, and then there's Anitus. Uh, he is right here. He's one of the people who uh, 402. This this is set in 402. So this is set after Anitus has helped overthrow the tyrants and brought the radical democracy back in. And again, the democracy wasn't any better than the tyrants. Um, so I mean, I always knew that Anitus was one of, was the person who accused Socrates and brought him to trial in 399. I hadn't realized that he was actually such a major player in the history of Athens at that point. So when you know you look at the 
I mean, these things are tragedies. These things are no less tragedies as Richard III or any of Shakespeare's tragedies and so on. But there's something else, because you have the very rigorous solution to the tragedy embedded throughout the entire dialogues. That is, what Plato does with these dialogues is not only hold up the flaws, the inadequacies of these people, but he actually, as we know, the subject of the, the fundamental subject of the dialogues is how does the human mind know the truth? How do you actually discover universal truthful principles? As Lynn dis- discusses it in his latest uh, paper um, of visualizing the complex domain, this is the subject of Plato's dialogues. This is what makes Plato's dialogues absolutely revolutionary. Because many of these figures, Nicias, probably Critias at the beginning, Carmides, maybe even Alcibiades at the beginning, although he seemed to be a little more a creature of his passions than most of these guys. But many of these people were not bad people. They just did not have any method for, or any passion for understanding what is actually truthful. How do you know the truth? How do you use your mind to actually know the truth? So that in, in the body of Plato's dialogues, the Theotetus takes place a lot later. It takes place somewhere down in 380-something or so on. Um, but in, 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 in Plato's dialogues, you not only have the holding up and exposing what is wrong with the society, but you actually have embedded in it, within it the actual solution. And when you look at what Lynn has created with the LaRouche Youth Movement at this point, I mean, this is the solution to the tragedy of the last 60 years here in the United States. You know, was the World War II generation bad? No. But they really just lost any passion for looking for the truth. They didn't communicate any, pa- any idea that there even was truth, frankly, uh, to the baby boomer generation. You know, were they all evil? No, they weren't. But the absence of any commitment to function from the standpoint of knowable universal principles allows something like the synarchists or the Persians or whatever your agent of evil is to come in and undermine your society. I mean, that's, it's, it's not the conspiracy theories you know, of the John Birch Society or you know, the populists and so on. You know, I can give you the list of people who are in the Bilderbergers and the Council on Foreign Relations and so on. No, the real conspiracy is much more out in the open. It's the battle between ideas, Lynn's ideas, Plato's ideas, versus the ideas of these guys. And the battleground is the minds of the population. And that's where Lynn has created an absolutely new power on the planet. Plato is, as far as I can think in history, Plato is the only one who even tried to do what Lynn is doing right now which is to actually create a youth movement which is based not just on uh, virtues, some concept of justice, some concept of goodness. I mean, in a sense, um, you know, if you look at the original LaRouche youth movement, you know, the one that joined in the early 70s like I did and so on, uh, you know, we did not put ourselves through the intellectual rigor of actually knowing absolutely that what Lynn was saying was truthful. I could argue it politically, I could argue it economically, uh, couldn't really argue it philosophically, and I couldn't certainly argue it from the standpoint of Gauss, from the standpoint of actually knowing how you actually do know the universe. So what Lynn has actually created in terms of the youth movement today is the ultimate solution to the tragedy which engulfed our society and which engulfed Athenian society before. So this is a new power in the universe. Uh, Any of you who are not signed up to come to the Cadre School this weekend ought to come so that you can participate in being this new power in the universe and uh, make Plato's dialogues uh, uh, do their real job, which is to solve the problem once and for all. So I'll take any questions. Aaron, you still there? Yeah. Go for it. Okay. 
Early on, you said that... Oh, we're going to let Aaron ask okay. first, because he's been trying to ask me a question for two days. Go ahead, Aaron. Okay, in uh, LaRouche's new paper... Yeah. He talks about at the end, or in one of the footnotes, he says, uh, Demosthenes is full of rhetoric, is where um, uh, Aristotle came from as a deployment. Right. Could you talk a little bit about that and the history of that? Uh, Isocrates, right? Isn't that what he said? Yeah. Yeah, Isocrates School of Rhetoric. Um, I haven't gotten that much into the 4th century, you know? This was all the 5th century. Uh, there basically was, I mean, I can just say it in simple terms, but I don't really, haven't really studied the history of it yet myself. The Persians, you know, just like the Straussians today, could see the problem they had in Socrates, and then they could certainly see the problem they had in Plato. So they counter-deployed, and they set up, uh, this guy, Isocrates, actually went through the Platonic Academy. So, um, you know, I don't know, maybe you could call him the, uh, uh, you know, Kushro Gandhi or, uh, yeah, Laurent Moravec, Fernando Quijano of, uh, you know, of Plato's Academy, uh, because he was basically an operative, uh, either from the beginning or, you know, at a certain point in there. And uh, he, he, there, there apparently is historical evidence, but as I say, I haven't looked at the period. This stuff is all being manipulated by the Persians. In fact, you know, the more, with this map of the fifth century now, you know, to actually go back and see how mu how directly the Persians were really running all this stuff. I mean, it's one of those things where you know it's there, but I'd actually have to go study it. And that that essentially is what Isocrates and Aristotle were. I mean, that's as much as I know about that. Can you say who Isocrates was? He was uh, he was a rhetorician uh, school. He was basically masquerading as a Platonist, but um, was uh, uh, was really no better than the Sophists. And he set up his own school. Okay, Jason, you're next. Um, you had mentioned earlier in this speech, it's a more recent question, that Eisenhower um, didn't really quite understand the synarchist thing, or he, he called it the industrial, military industrial complex. Why, why? Is it just bad advice from his cabinet? Or why I think he it understood different? it. He just wasn't that. I mean, he did under. I think he understood the problem of Nazis since he had. Fought World War II against them, uh, but also that you had this higher, uh, this higher coordinating capacity, which was the bankers, the Nazi, the fascist bankers running the Nazi movements and so on. I think he knew what they were. I think he just didn't really know how to describe what they were in the context of American life. So he saw they saw it from the standpoint of a certain utopian military standpoint. And there were certain industries that these guys dominated, uh, but he wasn't a Lyndon LaRouche, so I think he just didn't really know how to communicate to the American population what he was actually dealing with. So he didn't know so that way he, or he couldn't really express it really well. And you know, I mean, I'm, I, I don't know this, the, the history that well. I mean, obviously Eisenhower is somebody who obviously had military courage, but you know, what kind of moral and political courage would have it have taken in 1959 or 1960 to stand up and say, you know, hey, folks, we still got Nazis running around the United States? Yeah. Um, this is the first time I've ever heard when we went through the uh, the dialogue in Plato, and I was sitting here writing all this down, thinking about it. And I was thinking all of a sudden, what Plato was doing, he was creating a negative proof of, which is the best type of proof. Mm -hmm. How you can actually prove something. He's creating a negative proof of the many different ideas that he was going through, mm -hmm. historical references to do that. Mm -hmm. So he was trying to educate the people. He was trying to show them to a negative proof. Right. How, what what to do with a negative proof like when negatively defines um, a whole bunch of stuff but like the isoparametric thing instead of saying well a circle is this this right. place or like Kuzu doesn't say God is this he says well he's the none other right a negative proof so it seems like he was writing a series of negative proofs in classical tragedy form in order to communicate ideas which is something that communicates in the yeah 
Which I think is amazing. Yeah. And that's the reason we're getting Yeah. But he does both, you know, because then you take the Timaeus, and it's not a negative proof. You know, the Timaeus is actually a working through of how the universe is created. Um, the Mino is actually one of the most fascinating, because it's both. It's one where you actually have these figures in it, but it actually is addressing then how you use your mind. Whereas the Theotetus does not have a tragic figure in it. The Theotetus has got Theodorus and Theotetus, who are both great geometers. So you don't have that kind of quality in the Theotetus dialogue. Each, each dialogue has got a very different characteristic to it. It's completely fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering because uh, I think over the last 50, 20 years or so, rhetoric has been coming back to universities as a faculty. And what you were thinking about that as a, you know, as could, you know, what it could tell us about the time we're living in, or different administrations hiring spin doctors. And what that means. I mean, these the dialogues that deal with the sophists, and I, I didn't discuss all of them because I can't historically place all of them, but probably the numerical majority of Plato's dialogues deal with the sophists, which is rhetoric, which is spin doctors. So, you know, frankly, maybe we want to, you know, set a new standard for running, to, running for Congress which is you can't run for Congress unless you've read all of Plato's dialogues. Yeah. Right? Because... Yeah, right. <laughs> Gauss's paper and Plato's dialogues. And then we quiz you. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, politics has absolutely nothing to do with truth. Absolutely nothing to do with truth. Um, that's what has been beat out of the United States, certainly in the past 35 to 40 years. The last leader of this country who aspired to leading the country on the basis of truth was Martin Luther King. Um, and we have not had anyone who's aspired to do it since then, except for Lynn. But, but I mean, could you comment on why rhetoric is coming back as a, you know, dumb? Because if you base politics on, you know, simply who gives the best speech without uh, it being grounded in a search for universal principles, you're going to end up where Athens ended up, being manipulated by outside forces who can give a better speech. Who controls the news media? Who's got the most attractive nightly newscaster? You know, who do you like the most in terms of who's going to give you your news? You know, how much are you entertained by hardball? You know, and so on and so forth. So rather than uh, basing your policies on any kind of search for the truth, it is simply this question of speechifying, spin doctoring, and then whoever controls it then controls the decisions of your population, and you are then cattle. And you can be herded this way, and you can be herded that way, and ultimately you get herded into the slaughtering pen. Yeah, in the back. I think in a way that's almost more dangerous than having a dictator in some, in some ways because at least if you have a dictator you have somebody controlling uh, the media you don't you know what you're missing to a certain degree you know if, if you're being manipulated you don't necessarily know what you're missing you think that you already know everything but in actuality it's just a superficial knowledge uh, that's what's interesting about the negative proof stuff that he was talking about and what's interesting about Socrates and Plato. Um, for instance, I mean, I, I can't help but think in terms of certain conversations that I've had with, with, with some, some, some people, it's, it's not about necessarily the truth. And I make a very strong point to admit when I'm wrong. And I think that's one of the biggest ways of actually getting to the truth if you're truly interested in the truth. It doesn't have to do with the selfish, you know, you know, uh, uh, I guess philosophy of this is my idea, everybody else has to believe it. It's more about I'm not quite sure if it's this. I know it's not this. Alright, well maybe it's somewhere between here. Let's see, it's somewhere you know, the truth is somewhere in between. Uh, and these discussions that I've had with some people 
it seems that they're more interested in proving or having some sort of control uh, over uh, their world by being right. And for instance, uh, if you said, talking in terms of the negative proving type stuff, if you said uh, um, zero, zero is nothing that I want it to be, right? Then it has it's automatically something that you wanted it to be. So if you go around in a circle and, and if I'm discussing or debating with someone and their, and their mode of operation is only to negate everything that I've said to prove their point, it will eventually come full circle to where they're negating themselves and I've had that happen a couple times and it's really ticked people off because they've actually, once you go full circle, you know, uh, countered their own argument from the very beginning. So well, that's, I mean, Socrates does that throughout the argue, throughout right. the, the dialogue. That's what's so great about that. I right. think that's the best but, way to find But it. you can't take, for example, those dialogues, those negative proof dialogues, you can't take them out of the context of the fact that there is a actual physical geometry out there, which he describes in the Timaeus, which he describes to a certain degree in some sections of the Republic and so on. So there is, there is a, a there is something which uh, there is an actual physical geometry, as Lynn describes it, which your perceptual geometry is going through this Socratic process to try and discover. But there actually is something out there. Right. But Plato, I mean, what you describe in terms of laying people right around in a circle, I mean, he just you know, in these negative proof dialogues, that's exactly what he does. Yeah. How do you how do you propose changing the vast population from the Taliban colony to um, the people that are seeking through if if all they ever see is television and radio and I mean, it's got such control of the people, you know. Well, Lynn, Lynn addressed this directly a couple of days ago. He said the youth movement reaches a sufficient threshold. You know, we have enough people in the LaRouche youth movement, and we bypass the media. I mean, the, the solution to it is the youth movement. There, there is no solution. I mean, if it were a question of going out there and trying to abstractly convince baby boomers to turn off their televisions, um, you know, it ain't going to happen. I mean, their televisions may get turned off for them the day we have nuclear war, but that's not really the preferred way to turn the television off. Um, you know, it's the youth movement. It is a force of people who are, who embody this, this, qua this power in the universe of what Lynn is unleashing with this pedagogy with Gauss, which comes out of the tradition of Plato and so on. Because what happens when you guys intervene into a Democratic Party meeting or, you know, just out on the street corner and so on? You don't necessarily, you know, walk every 50-year-old through doubling the square or doubling the cube. Uh, but the fact that they know that you can do it, they see that you can do it, they see what you actually embody in terms of this passion for the truth, uh, that changes them without them necessarily immediately having to go through the process. The youth movement is the physical embodiment of this power in the universe, and that's what recruits, that's what's going to recruit baby boomers out of their psychosis. So we need more. So you coming to the Cadre School? Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought it was really interesting how you said that um, you know, Lynn and Dr. King were the last two people that inspired to actually use the truth in politics because I, one of my polemics recently has been how um, the LaRouche youth movement scares the crap that just the Jesus out of people in Washington, D.C. because he used the truth in this way as an actual political weapon. Um, but um, this idea of critical mass for the youth movement, um, Plato was clearly thinking very long term, but he was a master poet. He had some of the finest teachers available that day. Um, what was it that drove him internally as a human being to, I mean, how, did, how do you think he organized his mind 
nor to be so effective over such a long period of time. I think it was the experience of watching the execution of Socrates, because he saw he saw a truly sublime act, and he changed at that point. I mean, he was from a wealthy Athenian family, and he was tracked into sort of practical politics. That's what he was supposed to do with his life. And when he watched what the government did to Socrates, but then he watched how Socrates responded to this, refusing to compromise, refusing to flee, basically calling the bluff, you know, sort of, you know, taking taking the flaws of Athens at that point and pushing them to the point of exhaustion, because it is likely that the people who brought Socrates up on charges and then proposed the death penalty were actually basically on one level bluffing. That is, they assumed that Socrates would accept. See, what happens when you went on trial at that time is once they found you guilty, you could then, and they proposed a sentence on you, you could propose an alternate sentence. This is in the Credo or the Phaedo? I can't remember which one it's in. But is it in the Apology? Yeah. He could have proposed an alternative sentence. And it's probably likely that that's what most of the people were doing, expected him to do. Well, instead of you killing me, I propose that I pay a fine. And, of course, my friends will do it. Or I agree to be exiled. That's probably what they would have liked him to do, just get the hell out of there. You know, like the people who said to Lynn when he was indicted, you know, move to Afghanistan or something like that where they don't have an extradition treaty. Might not have been a wise career move. But Socrates, in a sense, called their bluff. You know, he said, I'm just going to, you know, I'm at the end of my life anyway. I've done what I need to do. I'm going to die in such a way that people actually see what Athens has become. And because he did that, I think that was the process of changing Plato. It really is the question Lynn talks about in the new paper, that the addition, which I haven't read yet, but I remember the question that precipitated it, that you can't talk about this without passion, without colors of passion. And I think that's what Socrates' death did with Plato. Okay, so start casting the symposium.